They grow up fast and get away. All right, friends. Hope you enjoyed that lunch. That, that's my favorite. We have different. Kind of goes through uh, That's my favorite one. Awesome <laughs> but. Uh, Kim, we're glad you're here. Good to be here. Okay. So I guess every, about everybody's back. We'll go ahead and uh, and get started. Kind of where I'm headed, so you'll know. Um, Want to talk a little bit about how I get prepared for um, thinking about and planning for Advent. And then um, if you think it would be helpful, I can talk about how I uh, go through uh, preparing a sermon. I know that, that we're all preachers here and we have our uh, our own ways of doing that. I, I would be happy to share a little bit and and you all might be able to find something in that 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 would be helpful. And then I think maybe the most helpful thing we could do is to um, to spend some time maybe sharing some best practices. Uh, there's only uh, well two of Rusty and I and we can give you ideas but I think probably we have a lot of good ideas to share here. So I provided for all of us the, the lectionary readings. Those are um, New Revised Standard Version, but those are the lectionary readings all in one place, so you, you've got that. And then I pulled out, a, um, this is from United Methodist Discipleship, so that second piece you have is a part of the information that's there. And I believe I listed at the top of that, that the website now, if you go to that website, you'll pull up about a 60 or 70 page document. And so it does a lot in talking about um, graphics and um, I guess, you know, advertising your, uh, your, your series through Advent in the community. Uh, it talks a lot about hymns and those were things that I wasn't going to try specifically to cover, but that information is, is done in a beautiful way there. So I would certainly encourage you to that and uh, and check it out and then I have a couple other websites that I would just offer to us as as places that we can go and then maybe some of you may have that uh, have that too so um, I'm going to start with two stories that I like to be reminded of uh, in the Advent season that, that kind of helped me get my bearings before I do a lot of planning and preparation uh, and the first is, I like to be reminded of Walmart. Um, 
on December 23rd at Walmart at about 7 o'clock in the morning. And I'm not sure what year it was, several years ago. But December 23rd, and I am rushing there to pick up, I don't remember, what it was or do whatever it was. There was something that I had forgotten that was on that long list of things. And, and so I find myself at Walmart at 7 o'clock in the morning thinking, how did I let this happen? You know, um, how, how did this happen? And so, you know, as you go into Walmart, you either go through the, uh, through the bakery deli section or um, over next to the pharmacy, usually when you walk in. This, this Walmart, I ran in uh, and was running through the, uh, the bakery section. And I hear on the, uh, the, their intercom, their music playing, um, good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. And then it gets to that part in stanza two, Christ was born for this. <laughs> and I'm in Walmart on December 23rd at seven o'clock in the morning. Christ is born for this. And I'm looking around and about the only people there at seven in the morning, even on December 23rd, are the people who are restocking the shelves from all the folks who were there the day before, who were snatching and grabbing and rounding up things that they could, you know, they, they could put a little bit of paper on and stick a bow on it and call it gifting for Christmas. And there, those workers were there and they were doing their thing. Christ is born for this. And I wanted to scream, no, no, Christ is not this, not this. But you know what? That's exactly what Christ is born for, right? And I just need to remind myself, so when I'm, when I'm doing my Advent preparations, I think of the Walmart crowd, me included in that, and everybody else who ever finds themselves at, at Walmart. Um, the people who are there who are trying their very best to figure out how to make this a wonderful holiday. Um, and they have in their mind the idea of what that is. And some of them will make it and some of them will just fail miserably. And all of us who find ourselves to that place every now and again, um, that's, that's what Advent is about. That's who Christ is here for. Christ was born for this. And so I try to remind myself that Advent is one of those times of the year when people are looking for that hallmark version of happiness, whatever that might be. And there will be people who will be more likely to find themselves um, directed to our churches during that time. So I'm asking myself, what would be the messages that I could offer to people who may not be here um, all through the year, but who may wander in during Advent. It's one of those times that, that for us, it seems to me, would be um, an opportunity for us better than others to be able to reach out to, to the Walmart crowd uh, that just some of them may find themselves in, in our congregations during Advent. So Christ is born uh, for December 23rd in the bakery section at 7 in the morning at Walmart and for all the rest of us um, and for all, well, that's who Christ is here for. <laughs> and then the other story that I like to remind myself of um, in, prep, in preparing for Advent is one that I heard and actually... Um, it came from Garrison Keeler, and I hesitate to even say that because he had that, that fall from grace, but he did tell some really good stories. Yeah. Um, and so this is one of those that, um, that probably if I were preaching this, I wouldn't say where it came from because, I mean, I'm, I'm serious about that. I wouldn't. Um, but this is a story that I heard a lot of years ago, and it was a story about a family that was gathering for the big Thanksgiving dinner. And you know how that is. All the food gets, gets, I mean, it's just amazing, the food that's there. And, and we want to, you know, we set it on the table. The mashed potatoes are steaming and the, uh, the biscuits are ready for the butter. And we want to have a blessing and then we want to dig in, right? 
And so at this particular family, there was a fellow by the name of Uncle John. And Uncle John was kind of the one who um, was the most religious of all. And so he usually got called on for the prayers, and the kids always hated it when Uncle John got called on because Uncle John prayed for everything and everybody. And so the children before that particular Thanksgiving were, were saying, oh, I hope they don't call on Uncle John because you know, he just prays forever and ever and ever. And he always ends up crying in the middle of his prayer, and nobody wanted that, and the potatoes got cold. And, and so sure enough, they called on Uncle John for the Thanksgiving prayer. And he did what Uncle John did. He prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he thanked God for everything from the first day of creation right up to the very present. And then, and then he thanked God for sending his son, Jesus, into the world to die for our sins. And when he got to that, to that part of talking about Jesus, Uncle John just kind of broke down. And probably off in the background, there were some little snickers coming from the guys because they were just waiting for that to happen. Well, finally, Uncle John finished. And they went through their dinner, and after it's all over with, the kids are all back together again. They said, I knew it. I knew it. He was going to pray forever, and the potatoes were going to be cold, and that's exactly what he did. And one of the other kids said, ah, doesn't he know him? And he acts like he cries every year. He acts like he doesn't know that Jesus came and, and died for our sins. Doesn't he? He acts like he never heard it. And somebody said, oh, yeah, he knows it. He knows it. He just never got over it. We've heard the Advent stories. We know them. We know what's supposed to, what's supposed to happen. We know that we're going to, on the first Sunday in Advent, we're going to talk about the second coming of Christ. We know there's a time when we're going to talk about John the Baptist. We know we're going to get to Mary in that journey to Bethlehem. And we're trying to figure out how to make it new, how to make it new, how to make it new. The first thing I have to do for myself is make sure I haven't gotten over it. I haven't gotten over the fact that, that there's an incarnation, that it is God in the flesh come to us, to, to live among us, and then how do I go about trying to share that with, with my congregation, when I had a congregation, um, but with the people that I will have, have opportunity to share with. And so the first thing I have to do in Advent preparation is to get me ready. Um, and I do that um, by going back and I gave you the scriptures. I would start by reading, reading through the scriptures. Um, I would spend time listening to some of that music that Rusty was, has been talking with us about. Um, try to find a really good devotional for the Advent season, so that and for no not not to plan how to preach, but to to get me ready for uh, for Advent and for the planning and the preparation that I'm gonna that I want to do with that. Um, so let me just questions or comments probably not at this point. Um, feel free to use those stories because they're um, they're for anybody that wants to use them. When I am, am spending time in sermon preparation, let me, I'll just go through that really quickly and then, then we'll move on. Uh, but my system for sermon preparation when, when I was serving uh, at Mayfair, which was the, the last appointment that I had where I actually got to preach every Sunday morning, I tried to set aside two weeks a year um, for sermon preparation. And, you know, one usually in the first part of the year and then about halfway through, but at two different times, um, and would try to take, if not a week, then several days. I didn't always manage to pull that off. Sometimes I could, could manage to get two or three days in a, in a row when there wasn't a whole lot going on at the, the church. And so I would just kind of, um, we, we were fortunate when I lived in Kingsport that we had our house in, in Virginia, and so I would just go there and kind of, it would be a, a retreat time for me to think and pray and look at our church calendar and figure out, you know, what the Sundays were and what the special times we had were, when we were going to do stewardship, do all. And so I would just, I would try to get my outlines then and then would 
like for Advent and Lent, which for me and for all of us are pretty big, big chunks of our, our church year, and we want to get those right, uh, then I would try to spend time thinking about uh, what was that going to look like. Uh, for Advent, one question I had was, am I going to preach from the lectionary texts, or will I use a sermon series? So let me ask that question. Now, how many of you all are lectionary preachers? Okay, and how many are not? Okay, so we've, we've got a, a, good, a, a good mix um, uh, of, of each. Uh, one of the things I found for the Advent and the Lenten seasons was if I was not planning to do the lectionary, uh, if I was going to do a series, I often found myself going back to some of the, the themes from the lectionary too. And I think that was, was very helpful for me. But I would, would try to decide if I was going to use an outline or if I was going to use um, le the lectionary or if I was going to use a series. And once I did that, then I would start with the scripture, reading, reading the scripture for each of those weeks. If it's, if it's the lectionary reading, that's simple. Uh, if I'm looking at a, a, a sermon series, then I'm gathering the scriptures for that uh, particular sermon. And once I get that, I just read the scripture and then try to let it sit. Um, ask myself, what are the things that, that jumped out at me in the very first reading of this? Were there themes that popped out? Was there something in this passage of scripture that surprised me that I wasn't expecting? Um, was there something I noticed this time reading through that I hadn't read before? And then I would, I would just kind of let that sit for a while. And then the next thing I would want to do is to, to go to any commentaries uh, that I had. Or um, if I'm doing one of my favorite sermon series to preach is a, a sermon series about different people. So for Advent, I would do um, Faces at the Manger, some of the main characters. I, I, I just love to take a person and kind of try to get into to their thought processes and what it maybe was like for them. And so if I'm doing something like that, I would look at uh, whatever I could find in the way of biography or maybe what fiction writers had said about that particular person, but just dig up those extra biblical sources, whatever they are, spend time with that, and then again ask myself, so what's surprising me in, that, in this? Now, if I'm looking at the commentaries, what are the commentaries saying to me that I did not expect? And I have Richard Lisher, who was my preaching professor at Duke, I have his words running over and over in my head always, and that is, let the scripture speak. We don't have the privilege of being able to um, make the scripture say what we think it ought to say, uh, but to honestly look at that passage and say, what is that, what is that passage of scripture saying um, to me? What, what do commentators say that, it, that it's saying? Um, are there things in that that, that surprise me? And, and from that, I'll, just, I'll, take, I'll take notes from the commentaries and uh, from the sources that I'm using, take notes, and again, I'll just let it sit. And for me, the, the, my favorite part of, of sermon preparation is what I would call pondering and stewing. And that's what I do. After I've taken those notes, I'll go over them, and, and then I'll just spend as much time as I have until Sunday um, asking what, so how is that all kind of working itself out? And then a couple days ahead, um, I would sit down and, and write out the sermon. I'm not a manuscript preacher. So I would, I would often just say, okay, I'm going to use this story here. I'm going to use, or this is what I'm going to, if I'm talking about Mary and how she was, um, you know, how, how she was, uh, her response to, to the angel, then I'll just, I'll make a few notes about that. But I, I don't generally preach from a manuscript, um, which allowed me to wait a little bit later to finish my sermon, and then, and I'm not sure I would recommend this for, for anybody, but I usually finish my sermons on Sunday morning. Um, I would go over it one more time. I mean, I had my outline, and, and, and I knew if nothing came on Sunday morning or if something happened and I had no time, I, I could go and preach that sermon. Um, but I, my pattern was uh, to get up and, and be at church around 6 or 6.30 or so on Sunday morning so that I could just spend that time fresh and new with, with that scripture and with the notes that I had taken and just kind of try to work it through. So that was, that was kind of my way of, of doing things, and I'm not saying that's the way it ought to be done, but if there's something in there that's helpful, you are more than 
uh, more than welcome to take it and go with it. Let me stop and ask if there are any questions there. Yes. Well, that's happened, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and that's that. That's a, one of the struggles about that. And one of the things that's helpful with that for me, because I do like to to preach with story. I am ve I keep my eye on the watch, and so um, if a church has a clock in the back, I'm I'm paying close attention to that, and so I can kind of gauge. All right, do I tell this story? Do I leave it out? And so because I'm not tied specifically to the manuscript, that allows me to, um, to shift around. But, but I would also say that uh, while I am not a manuscript preacher, it terrifies me to think about going into the pulpit without anything. So with, without notes and without a pretty full, uh, full outline. I usually have two or three pages of an outline. Uh, yeah. So that kind of keeps me on track. How much of that do you I do. Um, I, I try to remember, and, and what I will do in my outline, if I have, if I five or six big chunks, bullet points, then I can, if I can just see that bullet point, then I know what, and I try to go over that enough to know exactly what falls and what order it falls until I get to the next one. Yeah, so I, I spend a lot of time going over it and, and going over it again. And a lot of that would, again, would happen in that Sunday morning time of, you know, just, just making sure that, that I know what direction we're, we're moving in. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I used to preach from the manuscript, I didn't feel I had that freedom. And boy, it freed me up when I got away from the manuscript. That okay. didn't work for me. It, it won't work for everybody. But do you see that happening often? When a song has inspired you or the children have done something and just something you yeah. can enlighten that sermon with? Yeah, he's asking about adding things in, inserting it from... From the, the flow of the worship that morning, and yes, I have, uh, I have often found that, and sometimes I can just, you know, make an arrow where I think it might work in, you know, in the sermon, and I just kind of make a mental note that I'm going to have to adjust timing a little bit. Yeah. Another thing I did at Mayfair was to ask them to announce that the service would end at 12:15, and the reason for that is, you know, we we had several. You know, there, there were often times if we, we had different people who did the children's sermon, and Ralph will know this, we had people who, who would do the children's sermon and it would last, you know, way longer. And I'm trying to think, what do I cut out of my, of my sermon? And then I had people complaining because the sermon was 10 minutes long. And so I just, we just made the announcement that our worship service would end at 12.15. And, and that was the most freeing thing in the world for me because it gave me, uh, I wasn't so tied to the clock, and that 15 minutes, um, I, I don't, there may have been one or two times when there was a lot of stuff going on that we went to 12.15, but usually we were out by 12.7, 12.10, if we weren't out by 12 o'clock. But we just felt like we had to announce that time because people were really squirmy if they got to 12 and thought that was the unannounced time we were finished. So, okay. Other, other questions or comments? Yes, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you're talking about transition points between the sections. So you're saying if you were kind of doing what I did and not using a manuscript, that you would make sure there were several places that 
that was crafted and scripted to transition from one to the other. That's a great idea. I always like to, um, to have my opening paragraph or two really scripted and then the same thing with the end because I don't, if, I don't want to mess up either one of those. I, I want to be sure that I know exactly what that's going to be. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. That's and if you don't do it in the when you're reading the scripture to bring in the context and and I will spend a lot of time set because I have found whole sermons in the context. Um the story of Jesus asking the 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 disciples, you know, who do you say that I am? know that that happened at Caesarea Philippi and to know that Caesarea Philippi was a place where any number of gods were worshipped. I mean, that, that changes that whole thing. Now, that's not an Advent thing, but it was the first one that I, but you're, you're right. So context is, yeah, you, I mean, you can get a whole sermon just out of, out of the place and the timing of, of when things occurred. Yep. Okay, other questions? Yes. I'm in my fourth year. I, I, I was one of those uh, servants that came late. And, uh, but uh, one of my pastors was Spurgeon McCart for eight years, and he said many a time, he says, I've never finished a sermon. I didn't really understand that until I started preparing a sermon mm -hmm. every week. And there's so many things that you want to say that you don't right. say. And, and I think everybody in the room probably understands that. But I didn't until I became a pastor. Yeah. And then you, yeah, there are just things. Well, and, and as a pastor, you hope, unless you're a district superintendent, you're never guaranteed that next Sunday. You, so you, you try to unload the whole thing at one time, but, or you're, you can be guilty of that. You should have next week. And so that's, that's, always, a, uh, that's always a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, other, other questions? Comments? Um, yes. There's been times I don't have a lot of experience actually uh, preaching from the pulpit, so uh, I guess I use the example of other, other ministers that I've witnessed preach from God's Word. Um, they start out with uh, Scripture. Then there's been other times where they chop it up and your head's going in six different directions. It's all what they put down, I guess, for their manuscript or how they prepared their message. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's kind of hard to follow. Um, and uh, the, the few times that I've had the experience of actually getting up and delivering God's word, I find myself being nervous and, and kind of wanting to read what I've wrote, even though I've prepared all week or, or I know uh, the material that I put down and how important it is to get it out in an orderly fashion, uh, what's one good way that we can get away from that? From, you mean from doing the... Pray. <laughs> Some Sundays you get it, and sometimes some Sundays you don't. And I, I would think another piece of that is um, to to figure out what your your preaching style is, and play to your strengths. For instance, um, I am more of a storyteller. So so what I love what I love to be able to do with scripture is to take a scripture. And, and just unwind and unravel and kind of tease out that scripture through. And then come to the, after having done that, 
um, to say, okay, what does this mean? You know, so how how do what does this mean for us here and now? What what's our take home from this? What what's Jesus trying to say to us if he's the main character in this? Or or what lessons do we learn from these people? Or what's Paul's message here? Uh, that's my favorite way to preach. I find it very difficult, and I'm more likely going to end up with one of those those sermons that for me feels kind of disconnected if I try to, to take a passage of scripture and talk about that, and then, okay, now, and here are the here's point A, and then talk a little bit more, and here's point B and point C. Some people do that wonderfully well. Jim, my husband, that's how he preaches. And, and I've tried to, to preach a sermon like that, and it just, for me, it feels like it falls flat. And, and he does the storytelling stuff sometimes, and, and that's, that's just not his gift. So I would say find, and I know you haven't been doing this a long time, but try to find what is most comfortable for you. And then when I preach those sermons, and I cannot wait to get to the end of it because I feel like I could not be struggling anymore if I was reaching in and pulling every word out to, to make it fit. When I, when, and when I can finally say, okay, that's it, now let's sing the closing hymn, hallelujah. Um, and all through the closing hymn, I'm saying, God, I am so sorry for that. I promise I will do better the next time. I just, I am, I just blew that. And maybe it's because I was doing something I wasn't comfortable with. I don't think there has ever been a time in 30 plus years of ministry after I had one of those horrible episodes in the pulpit that I didn't have opportunity to speak to people after the service and somebody says to me, boy, that was what I needed to hear today. And I just take that as a reminder, I'm not in charge here. Um, that that that's, that's when God gets to do what, what God wants to do and maybe he just needed to push me out of the way and get my ego out of the way enough to be able to to say that. So even when we think we've done our worst, that would be my encouragement to us. Sometimes for somebody, that may have been when we, when we, we hit the home run that they needed to, or we allowed, we allowed God to speak through us in the way they needed to hear. So, yes. Okay. So, and then do your beginning statement, and then begin to build on it from there. And that way, you go from point A to point B, and your end statement winds up where you're trying to focus people. He also said to keep it really simple. Yeah. And I think that was really good advice. Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but I don't have wonderful stories to go along with my message. And as I've learned, I don't have a lot of like experiences with theologians and different people's perspective on scripture. So, like in my head, as I visualize, like I've been sitting in service and I'll say, What would I preach on if this was my opportunity to get up in front of this church? How would I do it? And, uh, and there's been 20 times out of 20 that I'll say, wow, that caught me completely off guard because I wouldn't have took it in that direction. Yeah. Um, but the lack of experience and, the, uh, for example, uh, our most recent DS, uh, Reverend Maynard, uh, I went to an annual con- uh, church conference, uh, a charge conference, excuse me, two years ago, and I felt like I was being fed the fishes and loaves. Mm-hmm. He told that story so wonderfully, and I'm sitting there going, wow, that was spectacular. I don't know if you've ever heard that message of his. Um, and I, I don't think, I feel like I would mess it up, and it kind of makes me nervous, and that's why I yeah. revert, reverted back to reading what I wrote, because I felt confident when I was writing yeah. it. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I have heard that sermon. He preached it at Page's Meeting House, and, and you're right. It, and he just told the story unwound it but it that was the way he told it and I would tell it differently and so do you and isn't it amazing that 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 God can honor all of that and yeah um I see question Amy and then I think there was a question back here okay I think the best way to manage flow over time is to go back to the traditional order of worship it's not a hymnal it's just a 
sermon early so the choir director gets in trouble. Okay. Um, <laughs> also, Dr. Callis talks about uh, tying it up with a bow. He said you, be, you begin and you take a little trip and you end up right where you've begun and tie it up neatly with a bow. And that's how I write sermons sometimes, even though he would appreciate my missionary. Um, I start with the end and work my way back okay. to the beginning. And that way I know I'm tying it up. Okay. This is where I want to be. If I start where I want to be, I'll end up back there again and be able to tighten it. Okay. And um, also, who, who can tell a story better than Maynard? I mean, he's, he's a good yeah. storyteller. Yeah. Put it, you know, an But you have stories. I went to a clergy group and someone said, I can't do a case study. Nothing's happening in my church. And the conference counselor said, you're not paying attention. Yeah. Pay attention. Observe the world as if it is it is target rich with illustrations. Not like you're starving for them, yeah. but that in God's economy He will make such an abundance before you that you won't be able to fit it all in one sermon. Yeah. Okay. So just pay attention because those those stories are out there. Yeah. And and she said she started her sermons at the back and works forward, uh, which is that's that's. That way you, you're sure you end up where you wanted to go. So because you end up there first, there or you, you start it. And put a bow on the, make sure that at the end you have a bow on top. So thank you. After the closing hymn, I come down, and my piano player is still playing. And I don't hit the boom And <clears throat> right away, I'll leave the congregation with a challenge or an image to take with them comes from the sermon. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a synopsis or a little sermonette to remind them what we've been talking about. And then I'll go, sometimes I won't even have a benediction. I'll just say amen. Okay. Or I will. Okay. So that's how you tie it up with a bow then? Yes. That's okay. How I tie it up okay. You let them sing the closing hymn and then you tie it up with a bow and yeah. wonderful. Okay. That, that works. Questions? <clears throat> Um, I found a wonderful article, and this is, um, again, this is, uh, I think this was actually at Ministry Matters, so that would be a website. I would certainly encourage you if you haven't, if you're not familiar with that. But this was um, an article written by James Howell, and he was talking about, you know, preaching through Advent. And one of the first things he reminded us of is, you know, we're here, we're taking, all, we're taking a day to figure out how we're going to preach through these um, services of Advent and, and Christmas and, and Epiphany. And there is so much going on in our churches that we don't have much time to preach during Advent and, and Epiphany and Christmas. And, and that's one of the things that, that he mentioned. He said, you know, we've got, we're so, we're music heavy. We have cantatas. We have children's programs. And, and one of the things he said was he tried not to, to get too upset about that, but to know that was going to be a piece of it and to think that, uh, that probably less was more in your Advent. So know what the, what the most important message is. And, of course, he said, you know, we need to, to talk about the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. And, um, and then he said, and he also said uh, about the hymns, uh, don't let the... Um, don't worry about singing Christmas hymns before, uh, before Christmas Day. So, and, and I know that that has been some of the conversation that we're going to, uh, um, you know, we, don't, we sing Advent hymns through Advent. And uh, let me ask, how many of you have, have music directors? Okay, how many, how many of you don't then? Let me see those hands. Don't have, how many of you don't have piano players who can play everything in the hymnal that's familiar? Yeah, I'm, and, and I think that really, we just need to be aware, that really limits um, us. I know I have a number of churches in New River District who don't have a piano player, and so, so they use the, um, the recorded hymns. And, of course, with that, they can, they can use anything, but what I have found is we don't know anything. And I know Rusty said that, that he wanted to be able to list, you know, be able to... Um, select the music. Can I just confess that the two things I like least about planning a worship service are selecting the hymns and doing the children's sermon. I, I just, I, 
Um, and so when I had music directors, I was very happy to have a music director and, and I said, okay, here you, you go ahead and pick the hymns. Now, we worked on that together. Uh, we met every Monday morning when uh, in my last appointment, the music director and I got together and, and I would, would try my very best to give her, you know, a couple of sermon series or a couple of uh, seasons ahead so that she would know at least the general direction I was moving in so that, that we could talk about the hymns. And, and then there would be those times when we got a hymn that matched beautifully with, um, with the scripture and with the sermon, and it absolutely bombed. And usually those hymns were chosen as closing hymns. And, and don't do that. Let me just say, don't do that. Um, if, you're, if you're introducing a hymn that people don't know, uh, I don't care how well it fits the sermon, if they can't sing it, what they're going to do is they're going to come to you after the service and say, boy, I sure didn't like that song. We should have done something that, that we all there's a lot to be said for familiarity. Introduce new hymns, but don't do that, especially as the close. For me, that's that's the thing that, you know, that's part of the last thing people are going to remember as they go out the door. And if they're going out grumbling about the last hymn, that's, that's probably not where you want to be, okay? Um, and that wasn't specifically about Advent, but I think Advent fits very, very well into that, too. Okay, um, let me give you a couple of websites that if, if you don't have those already. One is called Ministry, Ministry Pass. If, particularly if you do um, sermon, well this is, this is lectionary based as well, um, but for sermon series, there are a number of Advent sermon series that are listed there, and it's just, it's um, ministrypass.com ministrypass.com um, and then slash Advent Sermon Series. And then I spent um, a good bit of time looking at the Wesleyan Church website, which is not something that I normally spend a lot of time there, but uh, they had a number of resources for Advent planning and uh, lectionary and sermon series. So um, I think that's wesleyanchurch.com. Actually, it's just Wesleyan, yeah, wesleyan.org, resources.wesleyan.org. And then if you don't know about it, I think uh, Ministry Matters is another place. And then UMC Discipleship, and I believe that that website is listed on the handout that I gave you, but lots of good stuff there. Okay, um, let me mention just a couple of sermon series possibility. Yeah, Dale? Uh, there's a resource I use called homiletics.com. Okay. It, it's an excellent resource if you're a lectionary preacher and you want to know what you're doing. Yes, it does. Homiletics.com. Now that is a, that's a subscription, right? Okay, sixty dollars a year. I used that for several years, and and it is and it does have, I mean, it has prayers, litanies. It, it's an amazing resource. Tim, for those who do preach lectionary text week. Yes. Okay. Yes. Textweek.com. If you're not familiar with that. Unbelievable what you can find there. Um, text week, yeah, T E X T W E E K. Working preacher is free. It's uh, a podcast. It's really good. Okay, uh, text week is free also, and working preacher. It's Lutheran. Okay, workingpreacher.com, I guess. Uh, workingpreacher.com is Lutheran. It's free. Ken. Okay. Good commentary too, like teaching on the, on the word kind of stuff. Okay. 
Okay, she says there are commentaries there, and Ken says that it goes back several cycles, and most of these do. Um, I know Text Week does. Yes, Ken. Another one is we have several in the hosting conference that contribute to the Sermon Central. Uh, okay. We've got a lot of people that publish their sermons in there, but there's also anecdotal stories, there's uh, illustrations, there's a lot of a lot of information in preparing a sermon. Okay, Sermon Central, and that's dot com, right? Okay. And most of that is, I mean, you can subscribe. Most of it's free. You, most of it's free. Yeah. You can subscribe to that, I think. No visual uh, uh, media available. Okay, audio visual, all right. Other websites, I mean, I think this is one of the most helpful parts of this is just being able to share those resources. Yes, Matt. Strangely Warmed, and it's a group of uh, pastors out of the Virginia Conference. Okay. All right, Strangely Warmed. Uh, it's just a podcast. Oh, a uh, podcast, yeah. Strangely Warmed. I think you can find them crackersandgrapejuice.com okay. or something like that. Okay, crackersandgrapejuice.com. All right. They're pretty okay. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, now the, uh, there's a, a podcast that, um, it's called Pulpit Fiction, um, this is, a, I think it's a UCC pastor and a UMC pastor, and they just talk over the lectionary texts for each, for each week. It's it's um, it's humorous. It's um, at times irreverent, so you just need to know that about it. That's just kind of that. It's that's the podcast. But uh, but I uh, as I listen through, I mean a lot. They use a lot of different uh, persons, you know, talking over the text, and I found that to be helpful too. And that's a podcast. Work of the People is another yeah. website that has resources. Okay, Work of the People, and I is that that one is a subscription, right? I think it is. I think that's a subscription, but Work of the People. And, and Sermons.com is too. Right, Sermons.com, and that's subscription. You said it is. okay. But I'll tell you what, text week is that there's enough there to, to keep you busy. And that also has commentaries and, okay. All right, so there are a list of good resources. And, of course, for, uh, for my personal use, I, um, I have the Feasting on the Word set. Boy, is, I mean, for preaching, that is just, and, and lectionary preaching. And, you know, I... I don't always preach from the lectionary, but most of those texts that I need are in uh, Feasting on the Word and excellent, excellent resource. So that's my hard copy that I hang on to. And N.T. Wright is probably my favorite theologian, uh, and so I have his set of the commentaries. I think it's called the Luke, com is Luke for Everyone, yeah. And it's, it's a lot like uh, the Barclay series, Barclay commentaries. Um, very much in that, that same vein, so, but, but excellent material. Okay. Um, let me mention, I, let me do it this way. For those of you who are sermon series preachers, um, what are some of the best sermon series you've heard of related to Advent? Or what's the best sermon series you ever preached related to Advent? And sermon series preachers, Listen up. I, probably one of the best series I ever did. I, with Advent, I usually try to do a series, and I did, of course, this was a lectionary, but uh, I did the four people of Advent, and okay. Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, and, and Joseph. And that okay. was a great series of just looking at these people, their, you know, what would be going on in their life, what would okay. be Okay, so people of, of the story, all right. And I did the same thing and called it Faces at the Manger um, and have done that with the prophets, too, and did a series just on the, the voices of the prophets. Yes? We did a very similar series, uh, the associate and I. We would dress up the character and actually have dialogue about okay. what was going on in that story. Okay, so first-person yeah. dialogue. dialogue. Um, 
which I did that once. And let me say to our female clergy, um, Advent is a wonderful time for us to get to do dramatic monologues too, because there are a lot of good uh, women characters that that you can um, can do. So um, I mean, if you, one sermon series that I have have not done but heard of, the title of it was "She Shouldn't Be Here," and it talked about the women in the genealogy of Jesus. So Rahab and Ruth, and uh, and then also talked about some of the the other women, Mary in the the story, and of course, then you've got Anna and uh, and Elizabeth as well. So, um, so that's a good opportunity for uh, for female clergy if if the, if you want to do the dramatic monologue kind of thing. Yes. Okay. 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 All right, so using using the movie Polar Express, there was one that I read about they took It's a Wonderful Life and did the did did a, a sermon series from that too. Um I've also heard The Christmas Carol doing that. Yeah. So pieces the other sermon series that were just wonderful. not your birthday. I think it's what it's called. It was a wonderful opportunity going through that to use Christmas as an opportunity not to think about getting, but how can you use Christmas as an opportunity to give. And when I think about sermons, I think about more than the sermonic space that, that I'm in at the moment, but mm -hmm. how can that be a part of a challenge? How can that feed into what we're doing overall as a church? And we, we just chose a project to give to for Christmas all together. So, so we all work together to use Christmas as an opportunity to give together as a church. So do not use the slaughter series. That's a good one to look at. Okay. All right. Other series, I used that once. Uh, Christmas is not your birthday. I've also used a couple of the Adam Hamilton um, series just because they, they also allow for um, the small group studies, and, and that work is already done. And... Um, so those have been helpful. Others? You yeah. Would say, like I'm doing the redemption screen, which is based on okay. that, but I would, I would say that you've got to make it your own again. Yes. What you're saying. So I took what they had as an outline or a diving board and then developed it into that. So mm -hmm. don't just use it as it is. But okay, so the redemption of Scrooge and uh, with with the admonition that whatever we do, we have to make that our own. One of the things I found helpful was just, I just found a list of, of sermon series, and, and just from the title, I'm thinking, oh, well, you could do this, this, and that. And that's probably the better way to go about that than, uh, than using all the, uh, the outlines and the sermons that have, have already been prepared. One of, one of those was Arrivals. That was just the title for the sermon series, Arrivals, and it said, think about... Airports, bus stations, etc. So arrivals. Jesus is coming again, and he has come already. So if you were going to, I mean, what, what might that look like with, with arrivals as, as kind of your theme? Another one of those was called messy. It says, for Mary, it was socially messy. For Jesus' arrival, the environment was messy. And for us, our lives are messy. But Jesus' arrival shows us God steps into our mess and offers to clean us up. Then compare how messy it is to host family and friends for Christmas celebrations. So, so there's you a paragraph that might be a, a you know, a jumping off place into, um, to at least thinking about what that could could look like. So, what I want to do now is, um, I want to ask you, um, because I th I think what would be helpful for us, you and you tell me. What I would like for us to do is take the scriptures that, that I gave to you and let you divide up in, in some, into some groups. Would that work so that you can, can share through some ideas that you have used or, or you can talk about how, that script, how the scriptures for the particular weeks may, um, may give you an idea for, for a way to start? I think if we can walk out of here with several ideas, at least for for each of the Sundays, if it's nothing more than a couple words, I think that would be helpful to us, especially for, for those who are lectionary preachers and for those who aren't, these themes are ones you're gonna be using anyway. So does that sound like a, a good way for us to move forward? Yes, no? 
Yeah, okay, okay. So um, let's see. We In these readings, we have the four Sundays of, of Advent and Christmas Eve, So and then we also have Epiphany. So we could divide up into six groups. Um, does that sound good? Two, one, two, three, four. Let's do five. How's that? And we won't do Epiphany. Does that sound all right? Okay, so I need you all to, and you might just want to slide tables together. And let's spend, it's, it's 10 after 1. Could we spend 30 minutes or so with that? Um, and, and once you get divided, I'll, sign, I'll assign you a week. How would that be? One of, the, one of the Advent weeks, and I want you to come up with your best, your best work on that, and then we can, can share that together as a group, okay? Start moving. However, I need five groups and maybe just to, to jam a few tables together. <laughs>